Okay, I think we'll go ahead and, and begin. We've got lots to discuss, um, an exciting program for today, I think. Um, a warm welcome colleagues uh, to this CGI oral staff webinar. Uh, for those of you who would prefer to hear this session in French, please press the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen uh, for French interpretation for today's session. Today's session, just to remind you, is being recorded and that recording will be made available on the CGIR info point within the coming days for any colleagues who are unable to attend. And if during the course of today's webinar you have any technical issues, please write an email to events at cgir.org. That's events at cgir.org, uh, and we'll try to help you sort things out. At the midpoint of the end, at the end of the webinar today, we will be inviting you to take an interactive poll. Uh, we'll ask you to visit menti.com, which you've done, I think, several times before on your computer or your phone, and enter a code that we'll have up on screen, as well as sharing a direct, a direct link, a QR code at that point. For today's meeting, we have 75 minutes, and uh, the EMT, uh, I and the EMT are really delighted uh, to be joining you today, along with four newly appointed directors whom we want to introduce. In the first half of today's webinar, you'll hear briefly from Kundavi Elwin and myself, and then we'll move to introducing the newest members of our senior leadership team and hear directly from them. They'll be answering some of your questions. In the second half of the webinar today, uh, Kundavi Elwin and I will try to answer your questions directly, as many as we can fit in. As always, we've received quite a lot of questions in advance of the session, and we really appreciate that. We really appreciate the engagement. You'll have the option to submit live questions via the Q&A function. Again, another button at the bottom of your screen. Please know that we're collecting every question that comes in. And we'll be doing our best to, to respond within the time that we have, either live or in the chat or via other channels when possible. But before beginning uh, today's uh, program, uh, we thought it was very important to update everyone on the situation in Ethiopia. So um, as you all know, uh, we have a new global security, sorry, global safety and security team working throughout the CGIR meeting regularly and trying to manage, uh, to help support the management of situations like this. But um, in Ethiopia, uh, the leadership of the uh, CGIR campus there is, uh, has been just absolutely invaluable. So we have with us today, Gail Amare, who is the head of administration and the deputy director general's representative in Ethiopia. And she will give us a short update on the situation. So turning over now to Gail, please. Thank you very much, Claudia. And thank you for allowing me to say a few words about the situation here. On behalf of the CGR community in Ethiopia, I just wanna thank everyone for their outpouring of concern and support coming from around the world for the situation here. As you may be aware, uh, since about a year ago, the Ethiopian National Defense Force of the Ethiopian federal government has been involved in a conflict with uh, the Tigray Regional Defense Forces, loyal to the Tigray People's Liberation Front, or known as the TPLF. And in recent months, this conflict has spread outside the borders of the Tigray region, which is in the far north part of the country, uh, including into the Amhara region and the Afar region, which are to the south and to the east of uh, Tigray. Uh, on no November 4th of this month, earlier this month, the government declared a state of emergency, which gives the government the powers it requires to respond to the situation. So there are many conflicting reports and analysis and opinions, uh, but some feel that this has the potential to cut off supply lines from the Ethiopian Ethiopia's important trade route to and from Djibouti. This would put tremendous economic pressure on the country. And some feel that it also has the potential to reach Addis Ababa and to lead to a prolonged conflict that would not easily be resolved. So there are attempts to negotiate a dialogue and to arrive in an agreement that would help put an end to the suffering and the conflict. But so far we haven't seen many tangible results coming from these discussions, but we're remaining very hopeful. Our main Concern, of course, has been for the country and its future, and of course, for the people. There are a lot of people who are suffering, and a lot of us, whether we're in Ethiopia or outside of the country, 
We're concerned for our family, our friends, and our colleagues, many of whom are currently in harm's way. So there is a physical toll, but for a lot of us here in Addis, where it is relatively calm at the moment, there's also the mental toll in terms of concern and worry about our, our colleagues and our friends and the future of the country. So in times like these, the basic essence of who we are as human beings really starts coming to the surface. And our hope is that at this time, we can remember our essential oneness as human beings and not focus on the more temporal aspects of our existence, which lead us to war and conflict. So having said this, for the moment, things are very calm in Addis Ababa. For the most part, it's business as usual. We are going about our work the best that we can, and we're focusing on our important work of food and nutritional security. Of course, our duty is to hope for the best, and at the same time, we have to prepare for the worst. So we do have plenty of very good plans in place, and we also have a really good team of staff on, on, on the ground here to mitigate any risks for a number of scenarios that we have been able to come up with. Uh, at the same time, we're trying to facilitate the critical work that needs to be done in the meantime. We want, it, we want people to be able to do their work and continue what they're doing. So just as we're working very hard to prepare for worst case scenarios in, in terms of the security environment, we're also working really hard on how to get staff uh, back to the physical workspace in light of COVID. So vaccinating staff, preparing the campus. Currently we're at 50%. We are aiming to go for 50% capacity when security uh, condition, conditions allow. So again, I just wanna thank you all for your concern and support from around the world and from the EMT especially. And if anyone would like to discuss our plans here, if they have concerns, uh, you're free to contact me for a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Um, you can contact me by email or Teams, WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal. I'm on all those channels. So thank you very much. And back to you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. I'm sure that I speak for everyone when I say that our, our, our thoughts and concerns and our solidarity stands with everyone in Ethiopia, our, our colleagues, their families. Um, and all the people of Ethiopia, it's such a, such a difficult moment. And let me also thank, I'm sure on behalf of all of us, the tremendous work that you, Jimmy Smith, the global security and safety team and all the teams on the ground in Ethiopia are all taking to ensure and safeguard the well-being of, of our colleagues in particular. It's a, it's a very, very difficult moment and uh, we're deeply appreciative of, uh, of the efforts that are being made in, in these emergencies, large and small, that you have always uh, cared for our staff in, in, in Addis and across Ethiopia. So thank you very, very, very much for that. Thank you. People have uh, specific questions for Gail in addition to the, uh, the very many channels that she mentioned. Um, you could also potentially put questions into the Q&A that uh, we might be able to answer online as others may have similar concerns, we could answer those in the course of today's meeting. In the meantime, we will turn to sort of brief updates from the three EMT members on a sort of highlights of what's been happening in these last two months since our previous all staff meeting. So I'll turn first to Kundavi, Kundavi please. Um, thank you, Claudia. Uh, just in terms of highlights, I thought I'll speak about uh, one or two um, high-level achievements over the course of this year. We almost uh, end up the year. Uh, advancing the research and innovation agenda and shoring up our funding were two big priorities for us. So from the start of this year, we showed up big in the global events. Uh, which we did successfully starting in January uh, through the Global uh, you know, Adaptation Summit. And uh, right through the year in all the big events, the CJR team was very prominent, uh, speaking very uh, strongly about the research and innovation agenda. At the pre-summit of the UN Food Systems, the, uh, the climate agenda, the COP that just completed recently. And so it was just not the ENT members, but the senior leadership team, the scientists. So 
uh, CGR as a team showed very strongly and spoke uh, quite um, significantly in terms of the research and innovation agenda. So along with the advancing these uh, two areas, we were also quite focused in terms of the funding. Uh, this is something very critical in terms of a smooth transition uh, to, to support the investment plan currently under preparation and expected to finish by end of the year and to have the COP as a big moment uh, to bring all this together with the funders committing uh, commitment all adding up to a billion was a good moment. It covers the next three years investment plan, a significant share of it. And of course, this is just a start. Uh, we have a long way to go with respect to other funding, bilateral funding, as we have always said. And uh, as part of the uh, funding, we will also be looking at uh, the diversification, which I'm sure our global director for innovative finance and resource mobilization will uh, speak a lot about. So for me, um, I, I just wanted to sort of uh, really uh, use this moment uh, to share with you all this high level visibility and uh, getting this uh, funding as a foundation to stand on strongly as a key achievement uh, in, in the last uh, year. Thanks so much. Over to you, Claudia. And over to Elman. Thanks. Um, yeah, highlights, uh, or it's hard to choose one highlight. So much has been happening since we last met in, in, in one of these seminars. It, it's been huge progress on a lot of fronts with, with some really big lifts, pretty much either at the line or over the line. For example, um, staff affiliation, a whole very validation exercise of, of the structure, um, uh, the, the whole bunch of sort of preparatory work for the new structure. But I think the the standout for me really is about leadership and people. Um, we met for the first time as the the senior leadership team of of one CGIR of CGIR um, in 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 Rome in October, hosted by. Um, uh, kindly hosted by the Alliance, who have this wonderful new building and facilities to meet. Uh, it was an almost entirely in-person meeting, which was just fantastic. I, I just, you know, just the, I have to say the difference that makes in, in, in a change process like this is enormous. And we had the, about 90% of the participants were, um, were able to come in person. Um, almost all those that went um, were logged on online pretty much the whole time. And it built, you know, really helped build that kind of trust and energy that you need to get us through something like this. That team is 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 really pulling on all fronts right now. Um, Roland has kind of put up the slide of the senior leadership team uh, uh, as of right now, which is is now a, a complete team. It includes EMT, the global director, the regional directors, and and those senior directors that are also leading centers, but that's a really critical part of the change management process too. Um, and it was just a great atmosphere, colleagues, I have to say, you know, we, we had this sense and this analogy that ran through the, the meeting of, of kind of feeling like a, a group of trekkers or mountaineers that is that has been given a task of crossing a mountain range to so a, to a broadly defined sort of landscape on the other side of that mountain range. And and, 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 and being a pretty new team, you know, getting to know each other and charting a path and, and, and recognizing that there will be peaks and valleys and that when we cross a peak, we'll discover a, you know, a new path that we may need to adapt and change to and that we need to keep our energy for you know, quite a significant journey ahead. And, and really trust each other and, and take decisions and, and you know, work as a team. So it was, I don't know, there was a lot of practical things discussed in that workshop, but the key thing was, you know, I think we all left with a sense of confidence that we have the leadership team to get us through that mountain range. Um, we have the trust to do it. We're working well together. We're committed to that destination. Um, and we're going to meet again and do this quite soon because we're going to need more of this kind of discussion uh, across that leadership. So we're hoping to meet in February again, if we can arrange that. Back to you, Claudia. Great. Thanks, Elwyn. Well, from the science side, I think the, the clear, exciting highlight here, of course, is our, our portfolio of initiatives. As you all know, because so many of you have contributed, the first batch of the initiatives, the first 19 CGIR initiatives were submitted the end of September for external review. 
which was which is being moderated by the ISDC, our Independent Science for Development Council. And the complement, the remaining second batch of initiatives, will be submitted in the coming weeks. Uh, the submission is for a portfolio as a whole. So first and second batch is only a question of, of timing and of, of submission. The both batches are considered one coherent uh, portfolio of, of activities. And these initiatives are really exciting. They're really ambitious. I think we're all very proud and impressed by the work of the teams that have been working absolutely tirelessly to plan and design these initiatives, to take a look at national and regional presence and local expertise and weaving all the many uh, strengths that we have across the system into this uh, larger portfolio um, that really takes much more of a systems approach. I think we're seeing a quality and a vision in these initiatives, which is exactly what we were hoping for. And I can say that I had uh, I had the privilege of uh, being in Glasgow for the COP, speaking with a lot of our partners and our stakeholders, and the narrative of our portfolio, this uh, portfolio that with our five impact areas, all of which we seek to move the needle in, this idea of the three levels from sort of the micro of genetic innovations to the system level rafts, to the to the to the meta level of uh, systems transformation and the, the policy, economic and natural resource environment in which food systems occur. This narrative has been very compelling. It's been getting a tremendous reaction and, and great support from the partners and stakeholders that we speak to. It's also really exciting to see the way these initiative design teams are pulling together from across centers and, and sharing ideas and, and trying to look sort of differently and more ambitiously at many of the things that we've been doing and building on these. Also co-creating these initiatives with so many of our key partners as well. For those of you who are interested in browsing the initiatives, we have also launched an initiatives dashboard that provides details and, and targeted funding, target funding information, you know, the scale that we, we hope to deliver on. It shows proposed sets of geographic priorities uh, for, for the initiative. So that's really very exciting to look like. It's also, I think, a very important tool for us to be able to steer our efforts to achieve impact uh, across regions, across topics, um, and a great way to get a sense of the whole. So later this month, uh, we will meet with the system board and in the middle of December, we meet with the system council in order to confirm funding for these initiatives so that they will be ready to roll out strongly in January of 2022. So we've got some, some very exciting work ahead of us. And again, just a tremendous uh, thanks and hats off to these initiative design teams, the technical teams that have been pulling them together at the science group level, and of course, our global science directors to, uh, to Yo, to Martin, to Barbara for their leadership in, in pulling together this portfolio of the whole with tremendous support from the programs unit at the systems organization office to Sonia and her team. Alongside all of this, we're building a tremendous framework for results and, uh, and uh, impact assessment. Uh, and again, this is speaking very strongly to our partners and our stakeholders. So lots of excitement ahead uh, out of the science group. Um, let me turn back now, though, to Kundavi to introduce our new directors. Kundavi, please. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Yeah, uh, very excited about our new leadership in global engagement and innovation. Uh, again, sorry, it took a bit longer than I had uh, thought, but we have them on board finally. Uh, let me invite them uh, and in, in fact, ask them to speak about themselves, their vision priorities as they take on their new assignment. Um, at the same time, you know, you have already read their background. And so I don't want to go uh, to give a, a lot more about their achievements uh, in their past uh, work. Uh, but let me first ask Tamina, who's our regional director, South Asia, who has started uh, this week uh, in her new role uh, to come and talk a bit about the region you'll be covering, Tamina, and your role in the transition and other things you want to share with the team. Over to you, Tamina. Thanks so much, Kundavi. Um, so I just want to wish a, a good morning or, and a good evening and a good afternoon to everybody. Um, it's really great to be here to have a chance to interact with all of you. 
Um, first off, very quickly, I just want to reach out um, and thank those of you who did reach out to me when the announcements went out a couple of weeks ago. I was really touched by some of the kind words you shared, um, and many of you actually really generously offered to meet with me and to introduce me to many of your counterparts in the region. Um, considering that this is day three of my new role, uh, I've had a chance to only really meet with a small portion of you um, in the region, but I'm also looking forward to meeting with many, many more of you, um, both online over the next couple of weeks and then once I'm in Delhi um, and, and based there uh, and traveling through the region. Um, the other thing that I'm really looking forward to in this new role is actually working more broadly across the organization. Um, so I have a number of new colleagues on the senior leadership team that I'm looking forward to meeting and working very closely with. Um, but I'm also looking forward to working with many of you across the organization that I maybe haven't had a chance to work with yet. And uh, I think that's a, that's a great opportunity that I look forward to. Um, I, in the time that I've got today, I just want to talk really briefly about um, this role in South Asia. And what I'd like to do is to just simply share two reflections with you today. Um, so the first reflection I want to share with you is something that I've been thinking about as I've been preparing to take on this role, um, and even as we were going through the interview process. And that's really around the diversity of opportunity that exists in South Asia. Um, in my time living and working in South Asia over the last 10 years or so, um, I'm always, I've always been really conscious of the diversity of need and also the diversity of ambition that exists across the region and then also within each country, in fact. Um, you know, if you think about it, for example, India has very clear global ambitions, right? If we consider what we witnessed at COP26 last week, um, they're definitely interested in increasing South-South cooperation, um, and they very much want to see themselves and do see themselves already as equal research partners to, um, to, the, to the work that we bring into the region. Um, and then on the other hand, if I think about Bangladesh, um, in my time working there, you know, certainly there is an incredible amount of pride as a middle-income country. They want to continue to see that trajectory grow. Um, and the agriculture and agricultural research is going to be a significant part of that. Um, but at the same time, you know, when you think about economic indicators, they are still grappling with rising malnutrition. Um, climate change is still wreaking an incredible toll on the polder region of Bangladesh. Probably, you know, one of the one of the biggest issues across the globe in terms of the impact of climate change. Um, and, and then, you know, on the other hand, in other parts of the region, if we think about some of the, the economic development challenges that exist in Pakistan, for example, where we're dealing with sort of basic issues of food security, um, or even some of the recent political issues in Sri Lanka that have slowed down a bit of our work there. I just think that there's, um, there's such a tremendous diversity across the region uh, and within the countries that we need to consider. Um, and I know I'm not saying anything that folks in the region don't already know, or even many of us across the CG don't already know. But I think we have to think about that in terms of also country part, our country partners are also making different demands of us today. Um, they really want our research to support their ambitions and their self-determined ambitions. Um, they want to co-develop research, they want to share capacity with us, and what we've heard in many of our interactions with them already across the region is that this is a two-way street. Uh, we have as much to learn from them as an organization as they have to learn from us, and I think, uh, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm looking for us to be able to do in the, in the region is to really honor that and bring that to the forefront. Um, this is also, you know, this sort of a, a change and a shift in the landscape is also really promising to me. I, I find it really um, encouraging because I think there's an opportunity for more and larger research and impact um, in the region. Um, and I also think that there's a real diversity of potential support in the region. Uh, there's individuals and organizations um, from the private sector to the, to the philanthropic se sector that we haven't even begun to tap into yet. And I think with these new, with this new diversity of opportunity, there's also this um, diversity, a diversity of funding that we can introduce. Um, however, I recognize that we are going to have to be much more responsive to country partners' sort of larger ambitions, and we are going to have to think about how do we pursue much more targeted strategies um, across the region and within individual countries. Um, and so that brings me to my second reflection uh, today, which is around finding new ways of working together. Um, 
if I consider the ambition that we've set for ourselves across the 1CG, um, as well as the shift that our partners are demanding of us in, the, in, the, in South Asia, it's going to require, and it is already requiring of us as an organization to learn how to work in different ways. Um, across South Asia, that means bringing together a number of groups that have already sort of set their own ways of working. And these have been really successful ways of working up until now. Um, and they have you know, certainly netted us tremendous benefits. But I think there, we're going to have to challenge our ways of thinking now. Uh, we're going to have to try some new things. I'm fairly certain that we're going to make a few mistakes along the way, and that's okay. Uh, I think that's worth the risk. Uh, I think it's worth the risk for what we're capable of achieving in the region. Um, I think, you know, if I think about it, I'm still very much in learning mode. I'm, I'm again, I'm only on day three. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of drinking from the fire hose right now. But uh, if I was to speak directly to my colleagues in South Asia and those across the rest of the, of the organization, I would say that I'm looking for you to work with me uh, to certainly bring new ideas and new opportunities to the table, um, bring some you know, new ways of, of thinking about how we do this work and how we achieve these ambitions for these countries uh, and help to build out those opportunities in the region. Um, I really believe that we can play a really uh, active and incredibly um, incredibly strong role in helping South Asian countries to achieve their own self-determined ambitions. Um, and that's what really gets me excited about this role and excited about the opportunity. And I'm looking forward to working with all of you to achieve that. Um, I'm gonna stop there and I'll just hand it over back to Kundavi. Thank you for the opportunity. Excellent. Thanks so much, uh, Tamina. Uh, in South Asia, CGS centers have uh, really built an excellent uh, base, isn't it? Uh, so now we have an opportunity to take it to the next level. So with you coming on board with a larger team on the ground, uh, we really have an opportunity to do that, uh, bring the CGR's new strategy and innovation that speaks to the priorities of the regions and countries. So it's it's that role that the regional directors are going to play is going to be extremely important. Um, thank you. Uh, next, we have Joachim Lozano, uh, the new regional director for Latin America and the Caribbean. He has really a unique uh, experience and background. Uh, combining academia, IFI, um, government. Um, so really excited to have you come from outside of a CG system, Joachim. Uh, the, uh, please uh, come in and share your thoughts. Thank you so much, Kunda. It's a pleasure to, to be here with you all. Today, I'm greeting you actually from Monterrey, Mexico, where I'm currently based, but already counting the days towards uh, December 6th, when I will be, will be fully and formally on board as a CGIR a colleague of yours. And I'm really delighted uh, to be uh, going to be hosted by SIP. And I want to thank the SIP staff for having made everything very smooth for me to, to pass the way towards Lima very soon. Thank you. And I certainly trust the EMT's strategic guidance to make the 1CGIR model a true, a true success very soon. You know? uh, because I'm also very happy to be working under Kandavi's global vision and experience to lead us all in a very cohesive way for all of the regions that we're going to be working together integrally. Uh, it's going to be uh, very important that we are all very aligned, uh, particularly with the scientific teams, of course, as our core uh, uh, business, but as well as the institutional support teams. Uh, I'm very happy that we'll be all joining together uh, our hands to, to make this happen. But on the other hand, uh, talking about the LAC region, I'm going to be working shoulder to shoulder with uh, colleagues uh, over here to build trust, confidence, and an integrated approach to deliver on this need, under this new era of the one CGIR. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it because you may have already, already read it on the announcement and Kundavi has already highlighted a bit about it. But I'm going to bring on uh, to the to the to row my hands-on and field experience not only in the LAC region, but also working with the uh, multilateral institutions like IFAD, FAO, uh, and the IDB in, in Latin America. Of course, uh, my country's federal government and in the academic and education sector. But most of all, you know what I I will bring to 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 the to the role. Uh, 
is my devotion to working with people and for the people. That's that's what's going to make this uh, this happen. And uh, I have, you know, as, as Tamina was saying, uh, she was giving us two reflections, and I also want to give you to uh, to share with you two ways of seeing how we can work in the region. One, uh, what is the CGIR system can bring for LAC, but on the other hand, what LAC can give also to the CGIR system. And I'm going to start with, uh, with what I think that the CGE's uh, relevance is for, for LAC. Uh, as we know, uh, LAC is the leading net food support exporting region, and we have to help the region to make this position sustainable. Also, uh, I think supporting the mitigation of the region's natural heritage uh, to, uh, to avoid further deterioration and also to make, make sure that uh, there's optimal usage of the unused arable land over here. Very, very important is to, to, uh, to work very hard to lift rural people out of poverty, particularly the rural population and the disparities that persist in the region. We know that it's also the most uh, unequal region in the world. And in more or less that same sense, uh, we should be helping to narrow the uh, productive gap between the agribusiness, the big agri-industry agri agri industry, and the smallholders and family farmers, while we also uh, work together to overcome the impact of the pandemic. And now turning to what I think lack can bring into the CG uh, system is that uh, you know, further than the CIR centers that are based in the region, there are solid regional and R&D national systems that uh, can complement our work. Think tanks, academic institutions, and a lot of, of talent. Uh, there's also, you know, also here, you know, uh, as I mean, I was saying in South Asia, in LAC, I see that there are potential new funders, potential new investors from the private sector, agribusiness, private capital markets, the bilateral cooperation agencies, the regional IFIs, foundations, and I think also there is an important ground over here in LAC for testing and piloting and scaling up uh, to, you know, to make sure that uh, we can also use, use the, the region to pilot, uh, you know, new projects and, uh, you know, make, take advantage of the wide biodiversity and natural resources that we have over here and work together with all the regions and all the other partners within the CG and uh, around the globe, and uh, I would be very happy if we manage to ho to host further CGIR presence in, in LAC. Uh, I will also uh, stop here because I know we have a very tight agenda today, but it's been really a pleasure to be here today, uh, and I hope that we can meet up in person very soon. Thanks again for the opportunity. I'm really honored and thrilled to be joining CGIR very soon. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joachim. Uh, particularly your experience with IFIs and private sector will be extremely helpful for CJR, as that's an area that we really want to move in a substantive way, you know, in a way to finance, in a way to partnership. So really looking forward uh, for you, not only for the Latin America region, um, but for the entire CG system where we can benefit from your experience. Um, thanks, uh, Joachim. And let me now move to invite uh, Andre, Andre Sanstra, our Global Director of Innovative Finance and Resource Mobilization. Many of you know him. Uh, he's uh, been already with uh, serving as the Director, Funder and External Engagement at the CG System Organization and uh, quite instrumental along with a larger team in uh, delivering on our uh, funding for uh, the one that I was sp speaking about, um, the, the one billion commitment that came about. So uh, with that, let me turn to Andre, where the vision is not just um, system council funding, but uh, very diversified funding to achieve the larger goal of two billion a year that the, uh, the strategy has uh, outlined. So with that, Andre, please. Thank you, Kundabi, and, and really pleased to join the webinar today. Thank you so much. Good, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I wanted to give, I guess, two points. One is uh, a brief introduction to innovative finance and resource mobilization and the diversification strategy and how we're viewing resource mobilization, business development across the new CGIAR. 
I also want to give uh, a bit of an update on the recent pledges. So that was a really uh, strong signal of support from many of our funders. And I want to just give a little bit of a deeper dive into what does that mean? How does that translate to, to CGIR? And, and then how are we going to use that as a, as a, as a platform to, to continue to increase financing for CG? But first, maybe just a, a bit of a view to the innovative finance and resource mobilization space. The goal is really simple. It's increased resources for CGIR's research and innovation strategy. Um, it's financing good science and making big impact. So when we look at that, it really requires a new approach, uh, an enterprise approach to business development and resource mobilization across CGIR. And uh, we see this as, as really a shared responsibility. Um, we heard from Tamina and Joaquin who, who both expressed uh, you know, a, a, an interest and a, and a need to raise resources from the region. Um, that's part of that shared responsibility. So when we look at business development and resource mobilization across CGIR, there's sort of three main areas. There's, they're targeting new financial resources, new diversified funding streams for CGIR. Um, and the Innovative Finance and Resource Mobilization Group will, will, will basically uh, deliver those strategies. Uh, it's supporting the regions and countries as they develop their, their resource mobilization approaches, uh, their relationships, um, also some of the coordination where we can actually bring a much larger uh, CGI approach to, to, the, to business development and resource mobilization. And then it's also coordinating a lot of the innovation that takes place across the CGIR from the science groups. So there's these three main areas that drive business development. And we know that Business as usual, status quo, just won't, won't deliver what we need. So um, we are looking at how we can leverage one CGIR, the structure, the operations, the, 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 the staffing, so that we can um, access much larger and new channels of financing. Um, so I just give you, uh, I guess, a bit of an introduction to uh, the diversification strategy that couldn't have been mentioned. There are five key areas that we will be targeting in terms of financial flows for CGIR. That's the ODA, so traditional uh, overseas development assistance. Um, these are the traditional funders to CGIR. They are our system council members principally, but there is a lot more financing available through those channels, whether it's for blended finance or climate finance from those sources that currently is not uh, tapped. The second part is emerging markets. So uh, new partnerships, South-South uh, cooperation that Tamina mentioned um, when she referenced India. These are areas that we want to expand and really develop sort of new, large, meaningful partnerships with emerging markets. The third space is climate funds and finance. A lot of funders are investing directly into financial climate finance mechanisms. Um, we want to position CGIR and our research and innovation strategies as a climate finance vehicle. Um, there's a lot that we contribute to the strategy on climate financing, and it's something that, that we have uh, yet to leverage uh, explicitly with our funders. The fourth place um, is, is the uh, development banks and in-country flows. Significant, as you know, significant financing flows into countries directly. Um, these are loans and grants uh, and multi-donor funds, um, and there's a, there's a real opportunity to coordinate one CGIR approach in country through the new regions and country structures um, to develop large, meaningful uh, projects built off of the, the research and innovation strategies, as well as the initiatives that are being designed. And the fifth place um, is private finance and philanthropy. Lots of pockets of, of excellence across CGIAR, um, but also major opportunities to shift global flows of financing in support of our, uh, of our interests uh, in transforming food, land, and water systems. So uh, big opportunities there. So maybe I'll just pivot over to the, the recent pledges. There is a slide, if we can put it up, that would be uh, very helpful um, and can provide a bit of a view of, of, of what that meant. Um, so this year in, in 2021, we have been able to uh, mobilize uh, a billion dollars of commitments um, for CGIR. That's, that, those are commitments that begin 2022 and extend uh, for a number of years. 
Um, that was first at the Global Citizens Live platform, where we saw 250 million um, in, in commitments being made. Uh, it was followed by COP uh, for 780 million, uh, and we continue to build on that for future commitments. So these commitments span anywhere from one to six years. Um, they are principally for pooled funding. So this is really delivering on the promise of more in pooled funding for CGIR. Uh, and also uh, translate to uh, quite a bit of stability in terms of financing. So, you know, 97% of that funding, um, that billion dollars is um, multi-year commitments. And, and really it's, it's delivered on the promise of one CGIR. So there is a lot of excitement um, in the funder circles for one CGIR. They see this as a, a major platform, uh, a major contributor to their development goals. Um, and we are, you know, just scratching the surface of, of what's, what's available. When I describe the five action areas, this is just one of them. So this is just that ODA finance, and it's just a part of that ODA finance stream. Um, there's a lot more, more in, in the pipeline. So how does that translate to 2022 to 2024 initiatives? Uh, we are feeling very comfortable with a billion dollar plus uh, prediction in terms of the, the funding and support that will come in. Um, a lot of that will be uh, pledged this year, but we also see that continual pledges and in cycle, in three year business cycle contributions will be made um, over the next three years. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll stop there and, and happy to answer any other specific questions in the chat um, and back to you, Kundabi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Once again, I wanted to thank you and the larger team. Uh, that worked in the uh, several months to get us where we are today. Uh, but again, uh, resource mobilization is everybody's business. Uh, so I hope we can give uh, this uh, Andre and the uh, team all the help that they need. And certainly they will be taking the more strategic and uh, leading the organization in terms of the priorities and particularly on the, uh, diversifying, the diversifying the funding sources that Andre was talking about. So we just have started, we have a long way to go. Um, thank you very much, Andre. And let me now uh, finally turn to Lotte Pang. She's our Global Director of Communication and Outreach. Um, again, Lotte has a lot of experience in the field of communication, uh, coming from uh, the World Bank and uh, private sector as well. So great to have you, Lotte. Uh, CGR really needs uh, communication, strategic, smarter communication internally and externally. So uh, glad to have you and over to you. Thank you, Kundavi. It's, it's great to be here and to be finally on board and to have the opportunity to engage with so many colleagues in my first week. So let me start by saying I firmly believe that CGIAR is in absolutely the right place at the right time. In the same way that science has delivered the solutions we need to fight COVID, we know that science is key to meeting the other global challenges we face. But science needs support to deliver impact needs funding, a conducive political environment and partners and communications. So for me, it's an honor to have the opportunity to contribute at this important point in human history and in our organization's history. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what it will take to build a world-class global communications practice. Let me say that I've heard so much positive feedback in recent weeks about the communications team. So that's great. And I know we're starting from a position of strength and that we have a wealth of experience and expertise on board. But communicating as one CGIAR will mean doing some things differently. We will, as a priority, put in place the resources to support internal communications. We'll have a new brand coming soon, in January, hopefully, which is very exciting. We need to position that brand so that we stand out in a crowded field. We'll have a communication strategy that supports our global goals and keeps us focused on communicating impact. The strategy will make sure that we're prioritizing and not competing with each other for audience attention. We'll build new partnerships and relationships at the global level with media and other stakeholders. We'll continue to deliver high quality content and events We'll also drive and partner on campaigns that position us as thought leaders and innovators. We'll support knowledge sharing across the organization. We'll build communications capacity 
enabling an army of skilled spokespeople and communicators, and will develop global approaches to monitoring, reporting, and reputation risk. So those are just some of the ideas I'm excited to take forward. But this is the third day on the job, so it's really just a conversation starter. And I would love to hear your visions for communications and also about how global communications and outreach can support your teams. Finally, I'd, I'd like to challenge us all to be as innovative in our communications as we are in our science. The pace of change in media, news and entertainment is breathtaking. The ways we can engage audiences is changing in thrilling ways. We're in a world where people rave about Netflix documentaries on fungi and where an excitable train spotter on TikTok has 1.2 million followers, including me. And where podcasts or TED talks on history or data can change the way we see the world. So I think that if these approaches can work for trains and history and economics, why not for water, wheat and genetics? We have a 50 year history to be proud of, but I'm truly inspired about our future. And I'm excited to be here in the right place at the right time to help write this next chapter. And I very, very much look forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Back to you, Kundavi. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lotte. Really looking forward to all the experience that you bring. And uh, certainly the branding exercise, the rebranding is one of the big things that are going to come your way. Uh, with that, let me hand this back to you, Claudia. We have uh, the, the four new leadership. And with that, we have completed the entire senior leadership group. So uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Kandavi. And let me add my tremendous welcome to these new directors. They, um, they continue to strengthen the extraordinary senior leadership team that we have on board. And uh, it really is exciting to look forward to working with all of you and, and watching these directors bringing together uh, our colleagues from across the system and building on all the strengths that we have. Um, we do have a number of questions coming up in the Q&A. Um, uh, what I think I, what we have planned on doing is that Lotte would be uh, moderating uh, a set of questions for all of us. All of us. So um, I'm hoping that we can integrate some of these questions into that moderation and uh, put Lotte to work immediately. So over to you, Lotte, please. Thanks, Claudia. Um, this is really jumping in at the deep end, um, but that's great. I love it. So let's start this next half of the webinar with a quick poll. So the question which will be up on screen in a moment will be, what topic hasn't been covered so far that should be? And you'll also see on screen the ways you can respond. You can go to menti.com and you use the code 55217107, or you use the, the, the link that's uh, just been shared in the chat, or you can use the QR code. And we're gonna keep that on screen for a moment longer, and then we're gonna see the results as they come in. So the question is, what topic hasn't been covered so far that should be? Okay, let's, uh, let's maybe take a look at some of those results as they come in. Okay, so affiliation is uh, getting a lot of attention there. Annual funding, staff transition, job security, salaries. Yeah, so hopefully uh, we'll have some answers today as we progress um, with the Q&A. So I'm, I'm gonna to move to the Q&A now. And uh, so EMT is gonna address some of the many questions that we've received from all of you. Um, thanks to those of you who've already submitted some questions in the Q&A function, and we'll try and integrate those as we go along as, as Claudia says. So, Let's jump in. Our first question goes to Elwyn. Um, this is a question that's come from multiple people, including Emma Quilligan, 
Chanda Debashish and uh, in the Q&A uh, of, of the Zoom meeting, also Charles Kleinerman. And the question is, when will we hear about our affiliation? So Elwin, please. Thanks, Lottie, and I'll try and quickly um, pick up on a couple of other questions too. The, um, but look, on the affiliation, um, we aim to get letters uh, to staff um, um, by the end of this month on that. Um, took a, like many things, it took a bit longer than, than um, we'd anticipated, but you know, for good reasons. There were lots of in-depth discussions with centers. Uh, getting the data was, was a real challenge, um, but we, we're, we're almost there. So um, all staff will receive a letter communicating their initial affiliation um, with a, one of the 10 global groups or one of the six regional groups in the 1CGR structure um, uh, by the end of this month or in the first week of December, we hope by the end of this month. Um, the message will provide details on what the affiliation means, um, what it is, what it isn't. It will also offer a clear channel, um, uh, a point of contact, if you have questions or concerns. We're putting up a slide right now that lists those points of contact and that will be made, that information will be provided in the letter too. Um, and a big thanks to those individuals that, um, that uh, are, are, are the focal points for this. I'm waiting to see a slide, I'm assuming Roland will be putting that up in a moment. So just to recap though, um, we came up with this idea of an affiliation process um, earlier in the year, really to, to provide a, a clear signpost to everyone in CJR that we're all in this together, right? That everyone has a place um, in this new structure. Um, and, and it also became a really important data gathering exercise so that those global regional directors can have sight of what are their initial teams, what are the cap capabilities and staff from which we're building one CJR. So, so the affiliation was, was really a, a way to understand where each staff member could be positioned in the new one CJR structure based on their current responsibilities and disciplinary focus. Um, the, the affiliation is, is the, this initial affiliation was, was really a result of very careful consideration by each entity's management team and the one CGR leadership. Um, now that affiliation, what it is not, it's not um, an immediate change to your reporting line. It's not something that's written in stone that is unchangeable, that is undiscussable, right? It can be discussed. We will, I hope, have a more fluid um, HR arrangement in CGR where people will over time as their careers progress, move between different, different groups. Um, and it's not something that, you know, will, will mean immediate changes to your, your daily work, um, your job description, your contract, your compensation and benefits. It's just an indicator of a future direction and belonging to creating um, one of these uh, global or regional groups. The next step um, in all of this is to, um, is to gradually bring colleagues into the 1CGIR operating structure in, in a more formal way. That's, that's particularly through reporting line changes. This is gonna take time. This needs to be handled carefully. It will largely impact on the more senior staff um, and we'll be working on that uh, later this year and certainly in the first half of, of next year. And of course, staff will be notified ahead of time. One, one last thing on this, whichever part of the uh, reporting line structure colleagues are in, whichever group you're in, the whole point of 1CGR is that we're not confined to only working with colleagues in that unit, in that group. As we've seen with the whole concept behind the CGR initiatives, we're working across these groups. We're pulling teams together, um, whether they are project-based or, or on institutional issues. Um, um, so, you know, th th we are not, we will not confine ourselves to working within those boxes. A couple of other quick questions, Lottie, if I may. There was a question uh, whether there'll be a global headquarters or where will the global headquarters be? We're not, we're not uh, going down that route. We're not setting up a traditional headquarter based organization. 
Um, we, one of our strengths is our distributed um, capability. And with modern technologies, we can actually have a leadership group that isn't based in, in one place um, for those, those 16 um, global regional directors um, with EMT. We've got staff in key nodes, of course, Rome is one, Montpellier is one, Washington is one, but actually we've got amazing presence in Nairobi, in, in, uh, in Mexico, in, in Peru, and that, et cetera, um, in, uh, in, in all key regions of the world. And let's keep that strength and not build a, a multi-thousand headquarters anywhere in the world. That's, that's certainly not our approach. Second, uh, thirdly, there was a question on overheads and can we shift a greater share of funding to research? That's absolutely our intention over time. I think uh, my, my vision, our vision here is that as we grow our funding, we actually, the proportion of funding that goes to research over time increases because we will be delivering, you know, better quality corporate services more efficiently so the share of the rate of increase of spend on corporate services will be slower than the rate of increase on, on research because we'll be benefiting from all kinds of ways of delivering those services in an efficient and effective way. So we do, we do aspire to that by all means, and we do aspire to looking at ways to deliver um, the support for the research in, in a more efficient way over time. Lottie, back to you. Thank you, Elwin, and, and for taking that extra question. So the next question is for Kundavi, comes from Moses Siambi. When will engagement with national agricultural research systems begin? Um, we also have a, another question that's coming on the Q&A from Charles Kleinerman. Are we going to change our name? One CGIAR is, not, is only talking to those who are aware of our process, but not to a wide audience. New name, new logo. Um, and if it wasn't my first week, I, I might have something to say about that, but um, ha happily I'm happily I'm going to pass the floor to Kundavi on this one today. Thank you very much, Lotte. Two both very important questions. Um, on the national agriculture system, you know, I want us to really say that we have already started engaging. Uh, as you know, it's a uh, central to our new strategy this partnership and partnership for impact cannot happen without getting the national agriculture research system in the design of our initiatives and in the implementation of it. So I wanted to sort of emphasize the strategy, the operating structure, the investment plan, all have the national agriculture research system as a, a key focus as well. So uh, again, in terms of what we have done so far, uh, the regional directors have already opened a series of conversation. We had uh, the regional director for Sibana, Ali had organized one with the regional national agriculture research system partners. We had a similar one with the regional director for Eastern and Southern Africa, where we had the network of uh, uh, national agriculture research systems co-hosting an event and bringing all the key players. Similarly, a larger discussion with India where the acting regional director had organized. So there are a lot of conversations going on in terms of how do we sort of deepen our engagement and bring the national agriculture research systems in. As part of the development of the investment plan, the, the IDT teams have been really discussing and in engaging with the, uh, the national agriculture research systems. And all in all to say that this is something, an important part of our new way of doing business. And that's why the global director for partnership and advocacy is also looking at framing this as part of the partnership framework that is now being developed and uh, finalized. And it will also be part of the operating structure of the regional directors and the global director of partnership and the science team to, to push this engagement strongly. We are also engaging with the Rome-based agencies, particularly on the Global Forum on Agriculture Research Systems. How do we do it at the global level to do this in a more integrated fashion? So uh, if there are other thoughts, uh, uh, please do give us uh, good feedback because you guys are the people on the ground and engaging much more closely with the national systems. And the idea is uh, to collaborate, not to compete. The second question on the rebranding is such an important one. And uh, there has been question, what's our new name? What's our logo? How will we coexist with the center brands? And when will this all come about? It's, it's an important one. And I have to say, a lot of work has been going on in the last several months. In, during summer, there was the community of practices of the communication team. 
uh, that has done a lot more internal uh, discussion and survey, getting uh, the pulse of the staff within the CG system, and also other closer stakeholders like the board members and the funders. Currently, what we are done is taken that all that together and now engaging with a very uh, prominent global uh, advertising and uh, uh, you know branding firm to help us to get some uh, surveys done outside. You know how, how do how does this seem to testing out externally in the various markets. Uh, so uh, this exercise will uh, happen now and in the next few weeks. And once we have a, a final set of um, uh, you know, information coming together, we'll be able to share this with you all uh, in terms of where we are coming out in terms of our new name and our logo. Uh, how do we strategically and smartly combine the one CG, the CGR brand with the center brand and all of that starting in January. We'll be planning to do this in conjunction with the investment plan, the initiatives that will be launched so that we do do this uh, together. So the plan is to have this done in, in, in January and uh, before that to also be engaging with you also you have a, uh, a view on where we are coming out on this. Thank you. Back to you, Alote. Great. Thank you, Kundavi. And now back to Claudia with a question from Shitu Adeni Pekun. The question is, how is CGIAR incorporating youth into its initiatives, especially as it relates to agribusiness? Claudia, please. Great, thank you. Um, this is a great question. I believe it's one that hasn't come up before. Um, I think it's important to note that along with gender equality, youth inclusion is part of one of our five key impact areas. So we'll have a global measurable impact in these, uh, in these impact areas in the coming decade, and therefore really is very much uh, at the heart of what we want to be doing. We recognize, of course, that in particular in Africa, we have about 100 million young people, a youth bulge that will be entering the workforce over the next uh, 10 years. And we want to make sure that they can find, if they want, and perhaps be very excited about opportunities in agriculture uh, moving forward. Um, while we don't yet have an, a, a perfectly full picture of, uh, of where these will land in the initiatives, we do know that there will be a lot of opportunity, particularly in the market and value chain oriented initiatives and the regional integrated initiatives that are looking quite specifically at, uh, at these uh, regional spaces and can be quite targeted there as well. And we have examples ongoing of a lot of engagement with youth in terms of, for example, um, youth entrepreneurs and our resilient cities work, uh, internship and young research networks in the regional universities forum for capacity building and agriculture, the RU forum. Uh, as well as work, ongoing work that we've been doing with the award program, the African Women in Agricultural Research and Development. We're also specifically targeting women, youth, and vulnerable groups with direct interventions in the HER Plus initiative, harnessing equality for resilience in agri-food systems, looking very much at inclusion and testing social protections. And we're looking at, uh, in the regional initiative on Eastern and Southern Africa, specific work packages on youth engagement, empowerment through accelerator grants and technical assistance to SMEs. So this is an area where we're increasingly trying to engage and I really appreciate the question. Great, thank you. Um, and now we are, we have a question um, that's been recorded by Sylvia. Oyin Lola, so could we have that question on screen, please? Hi, my question is, what are the three challenges you have faced with the transition process? Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for recording that. And that one goes to Elwin, please. I'll be quicker than um, I'd like to be because we're, we're a little behind time, but, but look, there's, um, obviously with a challenge as huge as this. I mean, we are doing something that's pretty much unseen in the international system. Um, and, you know, we will be an example to all um, if we get this right. And I think we will succeed now. Um, so of course it comes with challenges. Um, uh, just very quick. Um, 
the fact that this is an unfolding sequential change is a real challenge. We would all like to see a blueprint with a nice GPS map with the exact coordinates of this destination, the exact route and where the traffic uh, jams are. It isn't like that. At each point in the transition, we need to rechart our course, look at the GPS destination a little and adjust it slightly. Um, and, and that's just natural in a change process like this. So it, it, the ambiguity is challenged. Secondly, time and bandwidth. Um, we have to use our existing staff to do this. We can't bring in those outside CJR to entirely do all the, the work of this change. They can certainly help as they are. Um, and that's just a real challenge for all of us. And, and we're, 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 that's a, that's a, um, we're trying to manage the pace so it's not doesn't get slowed down too much because of that, but obviously conscious around it. Thirdly, information. Um, uh, it's a challenge to get all the information needed to, to, to be able to chart that course with exactitude. And if I could add another, communications. Uh, that's, that, that's a real uh, challenge for this. There's lots of people, obviously, who'd like to know what's going on and should uh, and be part of a two-way discussion around that. And now we have a new leadership that can really help. Uh, and, and, you know, in retrospect, we'd, we'd have liked a bigger communications team even a year ago. And that's something we've, we're really building up and ramping up. If I could quickly touch on Judith's question, uh, I thought it was a really good question because it, 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 it characterizes various questions around this, um, whether staff will be assigned to project or system. Staff will be part of these 10 global or six regional groups in terms of their reporting line. They will be assigned to lots of different things, right? They may be assigned to, a, they may be working on a project. They may be working on institutional tasks that crosses groups, that cuts across groups. So we will all have a number of you know, roles that we play and, we, and, and the research staff will be part of a number of project teams, I'm assuming, or, or CGR initiatives. Um, and they'll be doing that from within a reporting line and, and being in a particular group, but they'll be working with many colleagues across groups. Back to you, Lotte. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to fit in at least one more question. It's a very important one. Um, and this one comes from Victor Comorel, and this is for Cla um, Claudia. So Victor says, how will initiatives be run? Who decides and by when? Uh, and that's echoed by a question uh, that's come in on the Q&A from Susan Ajambo, who says, what strategies are in place to ensure inclusiveness in staff involvement in the initiatives? And also a question from Charles Kleinerman. Uh, I think uh, uh, CRPs, are ending by uh, December 2021. So what will be the budget allocation regarding the new research initiatives starting on January 2022? So lots of interest in this. Um, over to you, Claudia. Great, thank you, Latte. And thank you to Victor and Susan and Charles for those really important questions. So where we are right now, um, we know we have outstanding people for these initiatives across the, the various teams that are, are creating them, and uh, these initiatives will be ready to launch in the new year. And again, I just need to acknowledge the tremendous work of these IDTs in creating the initiatives under the leadership of Barbara, Yo, and Martin. Um, in terms of the leadership of the initiatives once they are launched, the so global science group directors, Yo, Barbara, uh, Martin and along with myself, we will appoint interim leads for each of the initiatives to assure that we can move swiftly ahead with launching the initiatives without delay. Um, for the first batch of initiatives, which we hope will launch on January 1st, those appointments will be made very shortly in the coming uh, weeks, we hope. And we'll then have the opportunity to review interim appointments by mid 2022 and where appropriate, if appropriate, welcome expressions of interest for the longer term. In terms of staffing up those teams uh, and for, uh, for inclusivity, the initiative leads will lead the staffing of their initiative teams, but with the oversight and pending the approval of the science group directors and consultation with myself and the EMT. And this is quite uh, specifically in, in order to ensure that we are pulling across the full CGIR inclusivity to here uh, reference 
areas of expertise um, from across the system, as well as other factors like uh, gender, uh, geographic, or, um, uh, geographic history, et cetera. So there is a, a process in sight uh, uh, online for staffing up those teams. And finally, with regard to the budget allocation, uh, you will see in the dashboard that I mentioned earlier, not only descriptions of all of the initiatives, but the proposed budget allocation. So this is the portfolio and the allocation of budget that is proposed for each one of the initiatives. That becomes uh, an issue for the board to review, as I mentioned into this month board meeting, for the council to review mid-December, for the funders to pledge, in some cases to allocate or designate for specific initiatives um, and in others to designate for the full portfolio. And that will finally be captured with those various inputs in the FIN plan for next year, which is, uh, which again is, is, uh, is um, here I ask Carmen for the correct word, which the system council uh, approves in mid-December. This is very similar to the process. This is the process we have always had with CRP funding each year as these numbers change, as the, as the funders come in well with, with, uh, with their uh, priorities and their designations, and then it's all arbitrated in the FIN plan. So that is the process and all appears uh, on deck to, to, to move strongly into 2022. Thank you, Latte. Thanks, Claudia, and, and to all of you for, for those answers. And um, we have managed to incorporate some of the questions that came in on the Q&A, but I would highlight that those we didn't get round to, there will be written responses provided as well. So please check those uh, responses uh, as there are lots of important questions there. Um, we are going to round up with a quick final poll that's going to come up on screen now. The question is, with a view to future webinars and communications on the transition, what would you like to know more about? Uh, very important question. Um, so please go to menti.com with the code that you see on screen. Uh, use the direct link shared in the chat or use the QR code that you see on the screen now. And we're gonna just take a quick peek at the results of that. Affiliation, so yeah, affiliation, job security, funding details, quite similar to the, the earlier responses, career development, um, role changes. Great, so, so thanks for, thanks for the, that input and keep it coming. And now I'm gonna hand back to Claudia to wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you, Latte. You, you definitely jumped right in. Great session, lots of really important questions uh, and keep them coming. We, we will share everything that we can. But let me say, colleagues, that this is actually our final all staff webinar for this year. So I, again, absolutely have to express my appreciation for your dedication and your patience over this year. This year has been full of challenges and transitions. We have made a tremendous amount of progress with the one CGIR reforms, thanks to everyone's hard work. I believe that we are ending the year with real strength and looking forward to starting strong in 2022 as well. So for many of us, I know we still have uh, a hard sprint ahead in these final weeks to the end of the year. It seems to happen every year. I hope that we all will take a very well-earned rest over the new year uh, moment, a uh, hard, uh, well-earned rest for everyone to restore, to reflect on, on this uh, very challenging year behind us and the very exciting year that we have ahead. I look forward so much to working with all of you, with the, uh, the growing leadership team, with our newly affiliated colleagues as they will be in January and with this new strength and cohesion. That is my New Year's wish as we head to the end of this year. So thank you so much, everyone. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, be well, take care. And thank you. Bye-bye.
think so. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.